Okay, it's not Wednesday. It's Thursday. All this coronavirus stuff, lockdown, uh, holiday, three-day weekend. It, I'm all jacked up. I don't know what day it is. Uh, so I'm a day late. Sorry. Uh, as far as announcements, it's pretty slow. Uh, we had Senior Sunday last Sunday at our regular service. Um, it went pretty good. Uh, I'm really going to miss those kids. Some of those kids are going to be uh, very valuable wherever it is they go. Not that they have to go. If they want to stay here in Rawls, they can keep coming with us. Uh, I'm not like that. Um, but anyway, I guess that would do for an announcement. Uh, we have, we're have we having regular Sunday service. Uh, still not nailed down on when we might start any kind of Sunday school or anything like that. But uh, if you want, uh, come to the regular service. Uh, check it out. See what it's like. Uh, kind of see what things are kind of like now that the world is opening back up. Uh, we'll enjoy you being there. Okay, so let me pray. and I'm just going to get right into it. Father, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for this time in your word. Uh, thank you for the blessings that you poured out in this church and this community. Uh, be with us as we look into your word. Uh, speak to us as your people. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the last couple of weeks, um, we saw Jesus kind of come to the end of his public ministry, and now he's kind of uh, gone back into what I think is sort of like a safe house for him. Uh, this is a place, this is a home of a friend of either his or the, some of the disciples or both or whatever. Uh, probably a wealthy person. Um, just kind of a place where he can hang out. And a lot of these houses at this time, the homes are sort of utilitarian on the bottom half. So your, your kitchen, and your, there was activity on the bottom floor. So if you want to be able to kind of entertain guests or do anything, uh, like that, you would have to go to an, to an upstairs room. So he is in the upper room. Uh, if you grew up in the church, you should recognize the upper room. Okay. So let's just get into it. Uh, we're at the start of chapter 13. This little uh, time that he's going to spend here in this room, it's going to go from about 13 to 17. It's where he's really, he's ended his public ministry. He's concentrating in on his disciples, on the people that he loves. Okay. 13. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus came, uh, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I love the way that sounds. Um, he does that. He loves us to the end. Uh, the thing I want to point out is it doesn't say uh, Jesus, having known that his time was coming to an end, started whining and crying and throwing a pity party. None of that went on. He didn't whine. He didn't cry. Uh, he didn't even, like, try to get other people to acknowledge that what was fixing to happen was unfair. Nothing like that. He just loved the people in his life. He loved the people that he loves. Uh, it was more important to him that he show love than that he uh, fight his problems. And that we as people, as Christians, um, we should be trying to duplicate that a little bit. Because, I mean, recognize this isn't just uh, he knew something bad was fixing to happen or he knew he was fixing to go back to heaven. He knew he was going to be betrayed. He knew he was going to be arrested under false pretense uh, he knew that he the guards that arrested him were going to beat him and make fun of him jam a crown of thorns on his head he knew that he was going to be whipped I mean, lashed in a such a gruesome way that that lashing alone will a lot of times kill whoever gets that he's going to get that then he's going to have to pick up his own cross put it on the back that just got whipped and the flesh ripped all off of it drag his own cross through town while people throw crap at him and call him names to the place where they're going to kill him. Then he's going to lay that on the ground, get on it, and they're going to nail him to it. And then he's got to, he knew he was going to have to die the agonizing death of crucifixion, which is basically uh, suffocation after exhaustion. 
uh, terrible death. He knew all of that was coming. And still he wasn't whining. He wasn't crying. He was loving. And we as Christians today that want to be Christ-like, we need to try and be braver, uh, face our our problems with more courage, and make sure that we prioritize loving others through our problems. It, that's going to make for an incredibly powerful testimony if we can manage to do that. And we need to have uh, loving others and serving others, serving the people that we love as a high, high priority in our life. Okay, I'm, I'm going to come back to that, but let's move on. Okay, 13.2. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come, and come from God and was going back to God. Now, let's stop. I know that's kind of in the middle of the sentence. But let's stop right there. I don't want to, you can't, I don't want to leave that behind. So obviously he knew, he realized that that, uh, that Judas was going to betray him. Um, but it's this other part that I want to look at. The He came from God. He was going back to God. And that God had given all things into his hands. So... What he's going to do here is he, it, it makes the humility of his service um, that much more powerful because he is recognizing the, the authority which he has. He's coming all things given to him. He has power over all things. And instead, he is choosing to be a servant. He's choosing to serve others. Uh, that's not just an incredible thing of humility. That's also an incredible thing of effectiveness. Because when you are someone in authority and you choose to serve, your service is incredibly more effective. Um, I don't know, just in my life, uh, if it's, you know, I work for the school and we hire kids in the summer like the weed eat and help the janitors clean, stuff like that. So if I'm doing something, and I need some help. Uh, I need to pick up a, a really big pole. Um, I'm putting up a sign or something. Um, what's going to be more effective? A high school kid? Which, yeah, hey, big, strong high school kid can help me uh, put up a pole. But it might be so big that even me and that kid together can't do it. Or would it be more effective if the superintendent helped me? Not that he's, you know, at all stronger than I the high school kid, but he can say he's the guy that hires those kids. Like, hey, man, I'm going to hire you three other kids to help you during this. That's much more effective help. Or, hey, uh, here's my credit card. Why don't you go to Lubbock and rent a forklift to pick that thing up? Much more effective help. People in, if you are someone in authority, even authority over little things, if you can humble yourself, and learn to serve those things, it's going to make those people that are under you uh, be a lot more happy that they're under you and not someone else, and then it's going to make them more effective because they're getting your help. It, it's, it's not just humble, but it's effective. Okay, verse 4. Okay, I'll start back at 3 because I know I broke off in the middle of the sentence. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, laid aside his outer garment, and taking the towel, tied it around his waist. Uh, now, what he, if you can't read that big, bold part and realize that Jesus is fixing to wash the feet of his disciples, um, what he's doing, this is a beautiful picture of what he did in heaven when he came down as a person. Because when he is in heaven, he's sitting on a throne. He is, he is covered in glory and power and majesty. He's holy. And he chose to take, take, remove that 
set that aside and put on the skin, the flesh of a humble servant. It's a beautiful picture of what really happened in heaven when he chose to come down here and save us. Um, it's a beautiful picture. But the thing that you need to kind of understand is it's not just like he's uh, putting on, the, taking off his uh, outer garments and then putting on the clothes of a maintenance man or a janitor or something like that, or the yard guy. Um, in the Middle East, I saw this deal on YouTube where there were some Middle East protesters and they were angry at some, you know, whatever guy's running, whatever little, little bitty country over there. And, but there was a statue of him. And he was like in the public square. And the people that were protesting were coming up and taking off their sandals and hitting that statue like that. And I was like, man, what are them fools doing? Um, this isn't like, I mean, like in Rawls, we have a predominantly Hispanic culture. So, like, that's a grandma going to get you with a chancla. Uh, that's a, I'm going to punish you thing. In the Middle East, that's a, that is the most disrespectful thing they can do. Uh, because it's relating to that... Uh, their feet and their shoes and their um in the jewish culture of the bible days uh, washing feet was a job that only slaves did and it was also against the law if you were a jewish person and you had a jewish slave you couldn't ask that jewish slave to wash your feet it had to be a gentile uh, and gentiles were like to them considered like lower than dogs um so He's fixing to do a job that you can't even make some slaves do. You can get in trouble for getting your slave to wash your feet. And Jesus is fixing to humble himself and go from creator God to like less than Jewish slave by his own choice. Because he wanted to love his people. Uh, I just, you need to, it's not just he's doing something nasty like cleaning the toilet. He's really placing himself in a socially um, low, 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 low level. Okay, let's see what else we got. Five, then he poured water into it. Uh, you know what? This is getting into his interaction with Peter. And if I start with that, man, I'm going to be a 30, 45 minute long video. And I'm really trying to stay around the 20 minute mark. So let me just close. Let me just close here. Um, doing that, I want to go back up to that verse one. Now, if you'll remember, um, when I was talking before, we were saying we need to make it a priority that we uh, serve the people that we love in our life. I I know most of you. I guarantee you, I uh, just think of like a real immediate family, like your mom, your dad, and maybe one of your brothers and sisters. Uh, I think of my wife and my kids. Um, then you got like your friends, maybe a real tight one or two of them. Uh, and I'm 44 and I have three, two of them are brothers. Uh, those are my, I love those guys. Um, I'll, I'll give of myself uh, to show them that I love them. Um, so you thought of a real tight circle and Hey, that's that, uh, that's just the way people are. Uh, life will kind of have kind of trained you to be that way. Um, what I want to, Jesus will change that in your life. And I, I, I realized something this week, uh, well, really probably the last month. Uh, during all this uh, shutdown stuff, I've watched a ridiculous amount of YouTube. Um, and I like, I like camping. I like outdoor stuff. Uh, there's a thing on YouTube called bushcraft and it's just guys, you know, going out into the woods with like as little amount of stuff as they can and trying to survive. But I, I like that. It, it kind of, it's a survival thing and it, uh, it gives you good ideas for like camp setups and stuff. Like if me and Gunner go camping and stuff, but there's a, there's a million and one, uh, supposed ways to start a fire, but most of them are pretty similar, and the one that, that I think is the best, uh, when I was watching these guys do this, this is the way that, that Jesus interacts into your heart. 
So they'll go around and they'll gather up a bunch of little sticks uh, and they'll and they'll kind of group them off. This is a guy like a Dave Canterbury, if you're trying to look at what he's done. Uh, Dave Canterbury, uh, the Greybeard, Green Beret, uh, Corporal's Corner. They're all part of like a little survival school and they have very similar techniques and I like their stuff. Uh, Pathfinder School. Well, so they'll have little stacks. They'll get a bunch of like pencil size sticks and then they'll get some little thicker like thumb size sticks or so and they'll kind of uh, put the thumb ones over here to the side get the pencil ones and kind of uh, have little bundles of them right here and in that v they'll get some bark off a tree and not hard like an oak but like a a poplar tree or something where you can kind of like peel off a, a sheet of bark and then they'll ball it up and rub it together and kind of fluff it up it, it distresses it a lot. It makes little random hairs that come out. And they might get some old dead grass and just different stuff, different materials that they know a lot easy. And they kind of wad it up in this thing. It looks like a bird nest. And then they'll take that ball and they'll set it down and they'll get like a flint and a steel or a ferro rod or something. And they'll, until they make a spark in there. And then they pick up that ball and they'll blow into it and and make that little ember flare up till it catches that soft stuff on fire in there and then they'll kind of have that ball and turn it so the flames will go up into it and then they'll take that and set that in that little v that they made with the stick and when that ball gets good and on fire they'll put them little pencil sticks on top of it and then they'll wait until the flame starts coming through those pencil sticks they don't just pile all the crap on all at once That'll smother their fire. They'll put them pencil sticks on there, and then they might blow on it again. Then when the flames come up through that, then they'll add some of them little thicker, the thumb size sticks. And then the flames come up through that, and they just keep on, keep on, till they build whatever. You know, they got a good fire, a bed of coals. They can cook all kinds of stuff on it. But they start right there at that little bird nest ball and blowing on that single ember. That's what Jesus does in your life. Remember how we talked last week about how like living a life without Jesus is living a life without love, without truth, without life, without light. And then when Jesus comes into your life, he brings those things with him because he's the author. He's the creator of those things. So when he comes into your life, when you become a Christian, that he puts that ember there. And then when you spend time with him, you spend time in prayer, you spend time in the word. You spend time listening to sermons on the radio or, or on YouTube or, or whatever. Spend time thinking about him, talking to him in your head. Oh, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do here. Or, Lord, I sure am happy that this is happening. There's, there's someone to talk to in your life. When you spend time with him in relation with him, what he's doing is blowing his life, his love, his truth into you. And then as that grows and grows, He'll add some more. Okay, hey, I got you loving yourself now. Now I want to see you love your, I want you to love your wife and your kids the right way. I want you to love your mom and dad the right way. And then, and then as soon as you get to where you can do that, he's he's fed some more into you. Flames start coming up through that. And then, okay, now I want, to, I want to see you treat your friends the right way and your coworkers or the people you go to school with. I want to see you treat them the right way, your teachers. And then he'll allow that to grow. And as that gets up and feeds it, then you're, you're, okay, I want you to love people in your community, even people you don't know. He'll build that thing up to, man, I want you to go on the other side of the planet and love some people in a totally different country that can't even talk the same language as you. Go love them. Hurry up. He'll do it. He's done it for me. That's how he works in your life. That's how he, he brings you along. He nurtures something that he placed in you, that little ember. And it, he's never going to uh, overwhelm it with a bunch of stuff that, and smother that fire. He's going to nurture it. He's going to keep it. Oh, yeah. Now, now's the time to add just a little bit more. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, yeah. Look at it grow. Look at it grow. This is okay. Now's the right time. I'm going to put a little more. He does that. Let him do that in you. But be a big raging fire, a light in this community for Jesus. Think about that this week. 
spend time with him. Get some life blown into you. Uh, let me pray. And then we'll close this thing up. Father, thank you. Uh, thank you for this time in your word. Uh, thank you for the way that you love us. Thank you for the way that you grow us. The way that you grow uh, in relationship with you. Um, thank you that you don't overwhelm us all at once, but that you patiently and lovingly uh, bring us along as we're ready. Uh, thank you for your son and his sacrifice, and it's in his powerful name I pray. Amen.